This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling this meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order on Tuesday, May 5th at 6.01 p.m. Um, and before we dive in, I um, well, thank you to Amherst Media for um, streaming this for us on um, Channel 15. This, is, this meeting is being recorded um, and is, as mentioned, available live stream and on Amherst Media Channel 15 in Amherst. So our first order of business is to approve our minutes from our meeting on April 23rd. And those minutes are in our packet. So um, if folks have, um, uh, Ms. Spitzer. Um, so on the paragraph right before section C, where it reads, Ms. Spitzer asked if it is possible for Wildwood to be open again. I think there was, um, it wasn't that I was asking about whether or not Wildwood would be open again. I was just um, trying to understand, sorry, it, it's been a week, um, trying to understand what we were doing to make sure that the building itself stayed, um, uh, that we avoided the issues we had last time we closed the building for a long period of time due to facility upgrades. So I, I understand that Wildwood isn't gonna open again, but just trying to, uh, just talking about how we could protect the building while during the closure to make sure we didn't have issues such as pests and um, upon reopening of the building. Okay. So, do you want me to recommend an edit or? Um, no, I see, I, I'm seeing a CLO is commenting that she's got that. Okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer asked what we are doing for Wildwood. <laughs> I, I can bring it up. What That's we are doing for Wildwood Elementary School during the closure so that we do not have issues of pests upon reopening. Yeah, good. Great. Um, any other uh, comments or edits from the committee? Um, I'm going to, um, before we go on to a vote, I realize I neglected to take um, roll call. Um, as a virtual meeting, we do need to take attendance. So um, uh, I'll call out names, and if you just say present, um, if you're present, that'd be great. Um, uh, Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. McDonald present. And is that um, Mr. Harrington on the phone? Yes, Harrington present. Wonderful. Great. So now um, uh, I'll make the motion. I'll move to approve the minutes of the Amherst School Committee meeting from Tuesday, April 23rd. I second. Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, we'll go with a roll call vote. Um, McDonald, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Did I miss anybody? No. Um, so that passes uh, five to zero. And now we'll uh, move on to public comment. <clears throat> we, um, and before we go dive into public comment, just a reminder to everybody that is um, watching or listening, um, we are, we do accept public comment. Um, we continue to accept public comment at my email address, mcdonaldA at arps.org. Um, any written public comment that we receive by 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting, we'll share on screen for the public to view and the committee to read. Um, we are also new this week, offering the opportunity for the public to submit recorded public comment of their voices reading their comment. 
Um, there is a, um, a Google Voice number where um, members of the public may re leave a recording. Um, uh, and I believe it's 413-345-2949, but it's also published on, on all of our agendas. And um, tonight we have two uh, recorded public comments um, to share. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris to play back the audio. Sure. So uh, I'll see how the sound is and, you know, please, uh, any feedback on that would be great. But here we go. We're actually not hearing anything. Oh, you're not? Okay. So let me see if I can... <laughs> Sorry, I am. Um, so let me see how to do this. So the, the problem, of course, I realize is that um, too late, and let me think through this for a second, is that the person's, right now the person's phone number comes up as the, so if I share the oh. screen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disclose the phone Would number. Would you mind the... playing from my iPad? Um, yeah, I think that might be better. I apologize. I like worked so hard to get the audio and tested it out. And then only when I was about to do it, did I realize that I, I don't want to expose people's phone numbers when I do that. Sorry about that, Allison. That's okay. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee from Amherst and I have a couple questions. I'm familiar with public schools in New York and Vermont that began integrating synchronous or live online instruction into their distance learning several weeks ago. Why is DESE, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, not more actively encouraging and supporting synchronous instruction? And with Chromebooks and hotspots rolled out, what is preventing Amherst from taking advantage of popular video communication tools like Google Hangout and Zoom to blend synchronous instruction into the curriculum? Thank you. And our next call. Hello, my name is Carol Gray and I'm a parent. And I'm giving this comment to urge uh, you to do whatever you can to advocate for live teaching um, via virtual means, Zoom. Um, I teach um, at the college level and I've been using Blackboard Collaborate. It's been working great. You know, students. And students have told me they have some classes where the teachers haven't been able to do any live virtual instruction and it's really not been great for them. And, and they were really appreciating that in my class they could get live instruction and they could interact and they could ask questions and they could have discussions. It's just not the same. Um, they've done studies that show that uh, synchronous education that, that coincides with how work, so you still have the asynchronous as well, to have depth of thought and time to ponder over questions that you write about, but you need to have the live teachers talking and you need to have children be able to see other children and interact with them. Socialization is just as important a part of school as conveying the information and um, my niece goes to school out of state and ever since the coronavirus hit from 9 to 12, she goes she goes into a room with, with her laptop and she dresses up for school and she goes to school and she loves it. And the nice thing is her mother doesn't have to worry about um, supporting her. Some families really can't support this asynchronous uh, method at home well, uh, either because they don't have the educational background or they're working multiple jobs. We just can't continue like this. It's not best for our students. And uh, um, I don't know why we haven't. I understand the state is recommending asynchronous, but my sister, who's an educator, uh, said that's not what the studies say is most effective. And I don't know why the state is setting such a low bar, but I think Amherst should and must do better for our kids. Um, other states are doing this, and it's working just fine. Um, I, I really think that we should take the lead on this. We don't have to just offer what the state is offering. We can do more, and we can take leadership roles in pushing the state 
to read the studies that say that synchronous education works. It works better than just asynchronous. And the socialization that kids are missing uh, by not having regular classrooms online is, is really huge. Um, please, please, please take a leadership role and start advocating forcefully at the state level. But aside from the state, let's just do it. Call the superintendents in other schools that are doing this out of state and have been doing it for months, and you'll see that it's working well. We can do it too. Um, the teachers may not have been trained in Zoom, but I wasn't trained with all these methodologies either when I had to switch over to online teaching. So um, it does cut off at three minutes. Uh, so Google Voice is actually um, uh, found doing doing that for us. So um, oh, and I just closed the agenda. Um, I think um, I have not received any further public comment, but I um, encourage um, those that are uh, watching, listening, and tracking to um, to share their public comment. Um, going forward, either using that uh, voice recording um, or uh, by email to the committee. And with that, we'll move on to the superintendent's update. Okay, um, so a uh, couple pieces of information. So uh, as I think you were notified last week or was in the, the newsletter on Friday anyway, that uh, we were one of the districts and I'll speak specifically to the Amherst Public Schools that received uh, a grant uh, that we applied for, for $24,000 for bottle fillers with filters. So uh, really exciting news. Mr. Harrington, again, has a dual role in that, but thank you, Mr. Harrington, for your other hat on because you were heavily involved in the writing of that application. But this is great news for all three of our elementary schools. More details to come with where and when and all those pieces, you know, the when piece is obviously a little complicated by the current scenario, but this is really exciting news for our schools and definitely since there's one in the middle school right outside the cafeteria, which isn't far from my office, I see how much use it has and has one of those nice meters that tells you how much water you've saved by uh, how many bottles you've saved by um, using that instead of a water fountain or other tools, which is really nice to have the visual tangible um, support for students, uh, especially at the younger grade levels, to be able to see how they're helping the environment. So uh, that was excellent news. Um, we uh, It's Teacher Appreciation Week, so one of the things that we did is we sent out an email to families if they're willing to share stories about what teachers have meant to them or what they're doing to support them. And we've the good news and the bad news, we've received an overwhelming number of uh, incredible responses, how Ms. Westmoreland and Mrs. Figueroa are going to put all those together at the end of the week. I'm not sure, but that's why they have their jobs, and I'd be really poor at doing what they do. But it's been really heartening. The emails go to an account that's shared by by the two of them and myself, and it's it's been great to read the appreciation. So I, I would just like to offer for my own self um, just incredible work teachers have been doing under really trying circumstances, juggling their jobs, um, as well as uh, everyone's complicated, more complicated family life in terms of children, parents, family members that people are caring for. Um, it, it's not going to notice, and it's clear it's not going to notice from the responses we get from from families, but it's not going to notice by me or the administrative team as well. So. Um, just want to say thank you to all of our teachers for the wonderful work they're doing in very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, my third one is that we are up to 66 students enrolled for kindergarten. You know, that is a bit lower than what we would typically have on May 5th, but it's not wildly lower and it's not, um, it's not something we feel good that we're actually getting that many. It's also not necessarily on the top of people's mind, everyone's minds at this moment, given the other challenges that exist uh, for folks uh, at the moment. So we're continuing to get them in and we're continuing to, uh, next month we'll be reaching out with more information for those families, um, just about some procedures because we are starting to get some questions of what kindergarten will look like. We'll talk about that later when we do the COVID update, but uh, it's one thing that we have a, a logical pathway to be communicating to families currently in the district, a little different when it's families who, um, some of whom don't have an older sibling in the district, but um, the online form is working well and, and we're glad that we're up over, you know, 60, you know, typically this time of year, we would expect more like 80 or 90. Um, so I think given the stress on everyone's lives right now, uh, we're, we're kind of pleased to have 66 uh, at this point and, and we know they'll trickle in over time. The last one is that there was an MSBA conference call that uh, members of the town, members of uh, the schools, uh, particularly Ms. McDonald, Ms. Dr. Slaughter and myself were on uh, yesterday, actually, 
Um, and it really was just going over timelines, going over processes. I thought I would share a little bit of the timeline. Let's see if I can do this well. Um, since there's not audio, this should be okay. Um, there we go. Um, so hopefully folks can almost see that yet. Still loading. Um, there we go. Um, so you can see that um, our timeline started on May 1st. And uh, you know this first initial compliance certification is a very simple form for the town. That's not on our side. Uh, the town will be working to form a school building committee by June 30th. And you know, Ms. Mr. Bachman, the town manager, and I have he drafted a charge for that committee. We did ask some questions of the MSBA about you know, what they would recommend for size, group size and some other factors. Uh, and they gave us some feedback on that. And, um, you know, so that, that process will start pretty quickly, uh, the town council and town manager level. There's an educational profile questionnaire, um, which is due on June, July 30th. And that's the beginnings of an educational program. Obviously decisions haven't been made yet, but it is, you know, I asked explicitly, you know, do, do you want us to start talking about consolidation options in that uh, from an educational perspective? And they said, absolutely, it was on your statement of interest. We know you haven't made a decision, uh, but we, we don't expect you to wait to start th thinking through that. So that, that's the first thing that's really on the school side. Um, online enrollment projection, we'll work on sooner than that as well. Both of these two um, July 30th uh, deadlines, the online enrollment is um, looking at some enrollments we have from DESE, from NESDAQ, and then MSBA comes up with their numbers as well for a couple of different scenarios. I, I will say we had an interesting conversation about how difficult it is to project enrollment at this point because of um, the context we're in. Uh, every community is unique, and I don't want to pretend that Amherst is, is any uh, more unique, but I think in this particular realm, given uh, the two factors of many families um, starting to double up just because of the economic pressures and also because we are um, the major employers in town, our institutions of higher education or the public, um, like the first five, I think, are, are comprised exclusively of those two categories. Um, we may feel, you know, the population shifts may feel different here than in, in other communities. So we had a good conversation about that. It's something that enrollment folks are, are aware of uh, in every community that, that the trends, I, you know, I said explicitly, I don't know what the enrollment's exactly going to be five months from now, let alone five years from now, uh, but we'll give them the data. They can crunch it into their computers and then we'll advocate uh, on the town's behalf. Um, then the enrollment certification executed, that's really on the MSBA side because that's an ongoing dialogue um, between the district and MSBA. Maintenance and capital planning information, we'll get that again sooner than um, October 28th. Essentially, there are some bonus points that can be offered if we can um, show that we've um, invested, we as a town have invested resources into maintenance and capital projects over the last few years. Essentially, the MSBA wants to know uh, if we go forward on this project, are you going to maintain the buildings well? Or is your track record such that we don't have confidence that you'll maintain the buildings well? And if, if you do have background and can prove that, then you get more points, which is reimbursable uh, when a project actually happens. If you can't show that, that, you've, that the town has invested in its maintenance, uh, you actually don't get as many points. So that's something that particularly uh, Rupert Roy Clark, uh, myself, uh, probably Mr. Slaughter, Dr. Slaughter a little bit, will be working on with the MSBA. Um, you see a vocal, local vote authorization. That'll be just the final vote with the MSBA's language for the town council to appropriate the $750,000, which is what our estimate for uh, the feasibility project. At that point, a feasibility study agreement can be signed between the town and MSBA, and then it goes to a board meeting uh, at MSBA for them to approve our entry into that next phase. So um, I don't know if Ms. McDonald's anything you'd like to add, but that, that was sort of what we went over. We went over that timeline explicitly. Uh, I had some really good conversations about uh, paths forward, I thought. Yeah, that was um, uh, very thorough that I don't have anything to add, thanks. Okay. And I think that is all I have on Superintendent Update. Great. Any questions um, or comments from the committee? Seeing none, um, we can move on to the chair's update. Um, I don't have um, any 
ads or, or comments there, um, but I will, will invite, we don't, we don't have committee updates on here or announcements, but, um, but if a committee member would like to make an announcement at this point, um, I would welcome that. Mr. Denling? Yeah, I guess I would just quickly comment that today is Giving Tuesday um, and there are many amazing organizations um, that are in need of donations these days. Um, obviously not just because of the increased need, but uh, a lot of uh, non nonprofits, particularly in our town, uh, rely on public events as their, their key fundraising moments and, and those aren't gonna be able to happen this year. So I, I, would, I would just give a quick plug to so one of those organizations, uh, Amherst Education Foundation, they usually have their Spring Gala, uh, which is a big fundraiser. It's a great event. And AEF, as I'm sure everybody here knows, does an amazing level of support for our schools every single year, projects that would never happen without their uh, incredible time and effort. So uh, if you just Google Amherst AEF, uh, there's yeah, in the search results, there's a big donate link. It's pretty easy, um, you know, and even after, uh, Giving Tuesday, that's appreciated. I think it's, you know, we're entering a new normal where we're going to have a lot of organizations that aren't going to be able to run their fundraisers. And so if, if you're able to, if you're in a position to consider donating, um, it, it would be a, a good thing to think about. Um, I just, I just really appreciate all the work they've done over the years. Great. Ms. Spitzer. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick update related to, um, the superintendent's evaluation. So um, it's not on the agenda tonight, but I did hear back from Mark Terry that we would need to have a vote if we wanted to do the evaluation after June 1st. So um, we can talk about that later on agenda planning, but that's the latest update on, on the conversations we've been having about the evaluation. We said June 1 in the... <laughs> in the email. So we will go back and double check that. Um, I originally thought it was July 1st as well. Um, so we're having a text back and forth, uh, but um, I'll, I'll double check the date, but we will need to extend it beyond the date that we agreed upon in the superintendent's contract. Yeah, we want to. Great. Thank you. Any other Updates? No? Seeing none. Um, we'll move on to new and continuing business. And first item on the um, that agenda is the uh, COVID-19 and schools update from Dr. Moore. Sure, and I'll try to be succinct on this one. Um, so really kind of four things that I want to talk about. Uh, the first is that we are getting to, we talked about kindergarten registration numbers. We are getting to that time of year uh, at all of our schools where people are starting to think about next school year. It's obviously got layers upon layers of complication uh, right now for many folks. Uh, but one of the things that we're highly aware of is that we do have new kindergartners coming in. We also have new students at all the different grade levels, you know, who are either going to move to the area or whole host of other reasons why next year may be their first year in the Amherst Public Schools. And so one of the projects we're working on that we hope to have completion in the next week or two, probably two, is virtual tours uh, of all of our schools that we can put out and share with folks. Um, there's some pretty neat technology uh, actually through Google, so it's um, free for us, uh, part of our account as an educational organization, where uh, there can be 360 degree uh, pictures, you may have seen it, where you can you know, it's adaptable, you can control it, and we're gonna do voiceovers from principals, uh, welcome the students. So we're trying to find, uh, the principals are identifying, I think mostly have done uh, 10 areas of their schools where um, they feel like for families to get a flavor, it's a lot more professional looking than holding your iPhone and walking around the, the school. Those never, those always sound like good ideas and they, they end up like, um, you know, bad horror movies of, you know, the, the movement and, and no, no one comes out flattering the school, no less either. Um, so uh, it's a really nice solution. So we are working to have those. We're going to have a second round of work that goes to narrate those in Spanish as well for families. Uh, and, a, and a third round that's going to look particularly for students entering some of our specialized programs, Building Blocks, AIMS, and the ILC to have a little more work on those particular areas. So photos of those areas 
um, that's a little more specific and, and, and geared more to a specific population of students. So uh, those should be out, at least the first round of those, probably within two weeks, and then probably in a week or two following, we'll get the Spanish as well as the um, ones for students entering specialized programs. Um, so thanks to Jerry Champagne for his creativity and finding a, a, a no cost and exciting solution and principles for jumping in to identify spaces and narration. The second update uh, I'd like to give uh, captures also on the staff side about fall. Um, so uh, there's a resource um, that's been developed in New York City that's a, um, a roadmap to schools opening in the fall. And to be really clear, it's a process document. It's not a document that says people should be wearing masks, shouldn't be wearing masks. It actually identifies, rather it identifies um, and we adapted a bit, but we've adapted to identify nine areas where we're going to have some guiding principles. So over the summer, when uh, we, we likely will get guidance from both public health folks, as well as the governor and the commissioner, we actually have a, an on-ramp to be able to have those conversations and make decisions. So our staff is going to get an email uh, later this week, and the groups are instructional planning. Um, so this is really focusing on what does the beginning of the school year look like from an instructional perspective, knowing that students haven't been live in school for the better part of, you know, over, over five months? Um, and what do we do with knowing that what we're providing from distance learning isn't meant in, from, from everyone's perspective to it can't truly replace what happens in the classroom? Uh, a second group would be on social emotional planning, uh, similar to um, the academic planning. Students haven't been in the school for five months and we need to uh, figure out how we can welcome students. Um, this folks who put this together talk about, um, much like you do academic screenings at the beginning of the year, figuring out how we can do social emotional screenings at the beginning of the year. Again, that's not a decision, but that's the type of conversation that we want to have because it's it's we don't we don't get a window into what those five and a half months may have looked like for any child, and not to make assumptions, but to make sure that we're not um, we're not missing out on picking up on students who may need some support. The third group would be on facilities planning. So that's looking at um, sanitizing, cleaning, room, or room arrangements, physical distancing requirements uh, within our schools. The fourth group will look at school operations planning. This one's really focused on student transportation and food services as being areas uh, that are uh, different than the typical classroom environment and need some close thinking uh, and again, some guiding principles uh, so that we can think about that. The next one is technology planning. So we're obviously all steeped as we are literally right now in a different way of doing business with technology. And I think there's lessons in all of this, there's lessons to be learned about uh, what we've learned about ourselves as an organization, about what our capacity is, how it might be a little different. And also knowing that, you know, while we, we sure are hoping to be there in the fall, the likelihood of intermittent closures is a very real thing. And so we want to be thinking about that uh, as we didn't have the chance really to do it this year, we would have been thinking about that way before we get back to school so that if we do have intermittent closures, we're not retransitioning with no planning. So we want to be ahead of that. Um, the group after that, so I'm just scrolling down, is a communication and student enrollment. Um, so it's looking at communication and also really looking at uh, how do we do outreach to families I talked about before that aren't yet students in our, uh, aren't yet um, connected to our district. Um, in terms of the beginning of the school year and, and how do we do a broad outreach to that population. We have another group on athletics clubs and before and after school care. This, these are K-12, to so the athletics piece is less prevalent at the K-6 to level. However, the before and after school care and clubs um, certainly relates to the elementary level and trying to think through those areas. And some of those are not school run, but it's incredibly important that we have our, our thoughts about planning. Uh, the, uh, we have a couple more, sorry, I know it's long-winded, but this, this is the complicated operation, uh, family outreach planning. Um, so it's what the district can provide to support families to help ensure student success, including helping families, um, find and connect with community organizations and groups. We've certainly learned a lot that in a, in a non-physical environment, that's a really different kind of conversation than it is when students are, are live and in our schools. The second to last one is about staff support and planning. So it, it, this group is to plan ways to address the social emotional needs of staff. Uh, something that you've heard me say before is it's not just students who haven't been in school for five and a half months. It will be staff members who haven't been in school for five and a half months. And um, if they're the ones who are working directly with our students, we wanna make sure their needs are, are front and center and are thought through as well. 
And the last one is a governance group, which really has the facilitators of all those groups. So that's coordinating our efforts because there's going to be overlap between a lot of these different categories. Uh, we're going to try to keep these group sizes really small so that work can get done. Ideally, you'd want to open it up and have 20 people in each group. And then what we find is, you know, these groups are going to work, you know, meet of staff members uh, are going to have you know, somewhat limited time and run. Their goal is not to write a long plan. Their goal is to write some guiding principles that as we get more public health information, uh, we can do that because what we know and what we've learned over the last couple months is that whatever information we have in late June will be different than the information we have in mid August. So we want to build an infrastructure and a framework that can be uh, flexible and fluid as more information comes in. Um, so we're really excited to engage staff on this matter. They're really excited to be um, connected. I get tremendous numbers of questions from staff members on thinking about fall. One thing we're really clear on is this is not a group to make a decision about whether we return in the fall. Uh, that's not the goal. The goal is not to write detailed um, plans. It's really, can we have guiding principles that can be adapted to whatever the guidance we receive? You know, my, my example is often, let's not talk about masks. Someone else is going to make that decision for us. It's not the worth, not worth uh, focusing on right now. I'm not saying it's not important. It's not worth this group working on. However, to think through how we arrange our classrooms, knowing that we're going to have some physical physical distancing guidelines in the fall, that is a worthwhile conversation to start having. Uh, do we start with the first unit in fifth grade math or do we review the last couple units in fourth grade math? Those are conversations we need to have now because they're gonna inform summer planning. And that's the kind of grain size that we wanna have uh, as we develop guiding principles. And my last update uh, is on DESE guidance. So on, let's see, it was the 20, uh, 24th, it was at late April. We received uh, multiple documents from DESE, and, and I put my takeaways in last week's newsletter. But the first one is that, you know, for the most part, we're really well aligned with what DESE is saying. And, and one of the things that I appreciate the commissioners uh, putting in every document he puts out on this is the safety and well being of students, families, and staff has been and must continue to be our top priority as an educational community. We are focused not only on physical health, safety, and nutrition, but also on social emotional and mental health needs, which in could intensify during this time. So uh, not every state puts that in there front and center, and I'm appreciative that we're in a state that does that. Uh, my second take home, which was the most significant one, particularly at the elementary level, which is this district, is uh, the commissioner working with us to introduce new content, uh, that teachers should be introducing new content into the distance learning. Until this point, the guidance from DESE was to uh, creatively review formally taught concept, extend work, and go deeper. Um, the commissioner put out what, what I'm hearing from staff, and I agree, was uh, helpful documents about, you know, what, what some people call power standards, or basically looking at the standards document and saying, what are the key things that students need to be exposed to and to learn uh, in advance of the next grade level? And so the feedback I've gotten from most staff members has been, thank you. There's only so many times I could go deeper on the topics I've previously taught that it was getting, you know, you could do that for a while. And then it was getting uh, increasingly challenging to think of engaging uh, work on that. So um, the power standards piece were helpful. We made some decisions about what was appropriate, and especially in the social studies, to teach at a distance learning uh, environment that if there was heavily, heavy emotionally brought content at certain grade levels. It didn't feel great to our teachers and they raised concerns about that and we, we were able to work with them. But I appreciate our staff members flagging that and saying, do we really wanna go into heavy emotional topics in a virtual environment when we're not there to, to really be able to um, support students uh, in that way? And so that's the level of detail our staff got into and their sensitivity to the topic. But uh, again, that's the largest shift. Uh, the third one is about making connections with students and families has been uh, critical. Um, and we have a nice system where we are tracking participation uh, of students and families. And if we're noticing a student and family are not participating in any of the distance learning, um, our principals contacted, they've been reaching out. And then if they're still unsuccessful, um, the family center has been reaching out in different ways so that we have kind of a tiered response because uh, this isn't about compliance. This isn't about accountability. This is about making sure families um, know what we're trying to do uh, and supporting them to um, supporting them in, in the ways. And one of the things that we've found already when we have families who aren't participating, and there's frankly not that many, we, that number's dwindled significantly, um, is that many people are having real challenges where uh, respectfully, and this is coming from a lifelong educator, uh, being able to be uh, involved in distance learning 
given what else is going on in their lives, is, is a really complicated balance. And so we've learned a lot and connected folks to other agencies to receive support. And so that kind of um, that tracing of students and families who may be struggling has been really helpful, not only from an educational point of view, but also to support families who are in need who wouldn't necessarily reach out to us. But uh, we've learned a lot as we've made those calls. So thank you to, to folks for kind of making that process work, especially the Family Center who has been uh, front and center on families that we've been, um, the schools have had trouble contacting. And the last one connects to some of the public comments. So Desi recommended that asynchronous or non-live lessons and assignments should be the primary focus for whole group work. Um, the exception is for small group work, class meetings, um, and special populations, for instance, students with special needs and English language learners. Um, and they recommend that, um, you know, I will say from here, from Amherst, we surveyed families uh, particularly at the elementary level, uh, there was really mixed feelings about synchronous lessons. Um, I think some of that came up even, uh, for those of you who watched the social emotional, uh, the live stream show we did with counselors, uh, a lot of families don't, kids don't want to be on the calls. We tried to offer some tips on that with that resource. A and then there's been some nice moments too. And we, just to be really clear, we haven't said teachers can't do it. We're not banning synchronous lessons, but um, at the elementary level, which I'll speak only to because of the nature of this meeting, um, the class meetings, that aspect has been the most beneficial. The feedback we've heard from families and staff that, that students are able to see each other. To teach 22 or 27 um, year olds uh, using this format has not been seen, yielded the best results. Um, and so I know some teachers um, are experimenting with doing office hours, but doing it with like a third of the class at a time for less time and, and seeing some success with that kind of synchronous learning. Um, and so um, I think the state received the same feedback we did uh, about some of the, the responses. It's also, we've gotten some feedback. Um, classes sometimes were scheduled, synchronous uh, lessons were scheduled at the same time as food pickup. So we've resolved that problem, but you know, there's multiple food pickup locations that span about an hour and a half of time. So, you know, you have to X out a lot. And then we also, um, I think one of the other challenges is that staff members have their own children at home too. So not every not every staff member is able to be on synchronous calls at, at specific times all the time because they have multiple um, responsibilities as well. So I definitely hear that feedback. It was, I think the whole uh, what I've learned because uh, I'm trying to. Now that we've been in it a while, I'm trying to really make sure I'm starting to learn lessons for the future, is that there has been a few things in this district. Many of you have been with me on, on some things that have gathered some controversy in this district. There have been few things where the responses from the parent community have been as split as distance learning. Um, and that's because people's life experiences, how they're experiencing this pandemic uh, is really different, right? So. Um, you know, the range has been from, please don't make my child do any work, uh, right? I've got emails like, you know, this is not, they're feeling too much pressure to please make every single other kid in the class be on this call. We need more accountability. Um, and, and, and I'm not picking on two emails. I get those extremes uh, a lot in terms of um, how people are experiencing it. And we're trying to find the middle path, which provides ongoing resources, support for families and children. Uh, without creating an um, even more stressful situation for than what people are already experiencing. And it's a hard balance and we don't always get it right. And, you know, I think I've said this before, this is not what anyone was trained to do. So we're trying to take our lessons in and the feedback's been really helpful that we've received and people have received some tweaks. So I know at, at some schools, um, there was a call for more synchronous experiences and teachers have been able to respond with that. We're again, more in the class meeting Kind of model and that and that's been really well appreciated. I think the small group model has been much more effective from a teaching and learning perspective than the large group model, but it, it's still a work in progress and I think hopefully we're not in this world next year. If we are, we have a lot of lessons to learn and I think a lot of things we can continue to improve, um, but I want to go back to the teacher appreciation piece that um, I think understanding the stresses that our teachers are under, like many other working families who are trying to uh, do their same jobs with their children at home, at some point that pie isn't big enough for everything to get done exactly the way you'd want to do it. And um, I think that the stress that our families are under mirrors the stress that our teachers are under. And, you know, what we're trying to do is support everyone to get the most out of this experience. And I think we're continuing to get better. And the more feedback we get, the better we get at it. So that's, um, that's my uh, COVID update tonight. And I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Okay, thank you. Questions from the committee? Mr. Deming? Um, so with the, the DESE guidance document and the, and the other DESE guidance that's come down, can you talk a little bit about what what strength of recommendation is, is that really? You know, from, from the extreme of here's some suggestions if you need it, take it or leave it to this is general law and you're breaking the law if you don't. Like what, what strength of guidance is that? And the reason I ask is because, you know, like you mentioned, every district is unique and we have our own challenges. And within our district, there are going to be schools and teachers and uh, students where we want to calibrate things differently. And I'm just wondering to what extent do we have the freedom to, to really implement that across the spectrum? Or, or are, we, are we handcuffed by what, what Desi says uh, explicitly or implicitly? Yeah, I mean, it's their strong recommendation. We are not handcuffed to, the, to, to your point. I think that's a good one. I think some of the special ed ELL stuff because it's federal law and civil rights law, those ones are much more explicit than the general guidance from Desi. That being said, uh, and, and I think those of you who know me well know that I am, um, when Desi does things I don't agree with, I'm not shy about that. Um, I think on this one, given the context, I think they've been really responsive to um, to working with district, hearing from a districts what works and hearing from districts and giving advice based on uh, authentic feedback. Um, so uh, I think you're right that um, certainly a different outcome is possible with some of the Desi guidance. And, you know, um, I tend to think that they're coming with lots of experience beyond Amherst that's worth us um, considering. You know, and, and I think it's, you know, it's all anecdotal, but I do think there are schools that have been uh, using synchronous learning more than we have at the elementary level. And I continue to hear actually multiple times from families who are interested in transferring to our district because they don't want that, right? And I'm sure we have families who feel the opposite um, of that, that they want more of that. and if they can get more. And it's so it's a complicated kind of thing. And I think working with our staff um, and our families and students, we're trying to get the right balance on it. Um, so, it, you know, it's an interesting it's an interesting mix about um, what people are looking for feels more disparate than ever before. But I should have been more clear about that, the kind of DESI guidance piece um, the, when I was talking. So I apologize for that. I hear a lot of, before uh, Mr. Harrington, so the other thing I hear a lot of um, is just concerns about screen time more generally. Mm. You know, so that that's not necessarily synchronous versus asynchronous, although a lot of the in asynchronous work can be done off a screen. Um, but that's something that is very live. I got um, a couple emails about, you know, is there anything on Chromebooks that can track screen time? Because I'm really concerned about how much time my child's spending on a screen. And then other people are really comfortable with that and they feel like in this situation that's that's okay for kids and so i think it's it's again coming back to you know individual families i think it's because in their own home and it's making teaching and learning more public than it's ever been before like if you think about what school looked like two months ago for most parents they heard about it from their kid you know or a communication from staff member now they're getting like a document with lessons and and so you know i think that's also it's made lots of things more public and i think it's caused some questions for families about um, what their role is. And, and I actually think there's some opportunity here uh, for us to engage families and staff uh, about you know, education more broadly because of that. But that, that's a tangential comment that could lead to a long conversation that's not on the agenda necessarily, but, uh, but I just, uh, is one other aspect that I find really interesting as I'm reflecting on this. Yeah. Mr. Harrington, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I was just wondering real quick if you could give us an update on where we're at as far as the hotspots and. Oh yeah. Because I, I, I thought I had read something about that there was only like a handful of identified folks who didn't have access still. So I just want wondering if you could update everyone on that. Yep. So that's that's true, and we're 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 pretty much there. Uh, we've we did another pickup last week, and uh, what we find is, uh, in some ways, it's hard on the IS staff, but we continue to get a trickle. Right, so every time we think, okay, we're there, someone says, have you checked it on this family? They're now saying that they, you know, and some of the trickle is because people are losing their internet access. Some of it, it's not just because they didn't communicate. I wanna be really fair, because I think that could be negatively perceived. It's not because people didn't communicate that they needed it, it's that they, they didn't used to need it and now they do. Um, 
And I think we're going to see a lot of that over the next month or two, sadly. And so we have enough in supplies that uh, we have that. So I think at this point, we've pretty much gotten to every family that we know of. Um, but every time we say that, you know, someone pops up and we had a family reach out because they were moving within our catchment area. Um, but they weren't going to have internet set up for the next month. And of course, we're like, we're certainly going to give you a hotspot until you need it. Um, so we're, we're, we feel like we're in pretty good shape with that. Same with Chromebooks. We're, I think, at 400 Chromebooks or a little over 400 Chromebooks that have been um, delivered for K-6 to students. So um, that part has slowed down a little bit, um, I think, and, and because most families have what they need um, on that. Actually, oh, that reminds me. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. That reminds me of the last update I was going to give is that Right before the closure, uh, we'd collected, our schools had collected books and we were gonna do, not a book swap, but just uh, make books available for students who might benefit from having more books in the home for families. And so then obviously that went on pause because we were closed, but uh, Kitty Richardson uh, and some other staff, a librarian of Fort River, uh, Lanny Blackman uh, as well, have organized a way at the food pickup sites to uh, offer deliveries and offer those books to families so that they can have more paper books. And, you know, we waited the, you know, we went through all the public health pieces of waiting a certain amount of time since hands had been on them uh, and working through all the public health pieces of how to make them available in bags so that people aren't sifting through books like it's a library or a bookstore. Um, but that will, this week or next week, excuse me, going to be at all the different sites with volunteers so that uh, more families, in addition to getting their food, if they want, I think this week was a notification week. So at the food book up site, uh, at the uh, food sites, they're letting people know uh, this is coming next week and they can pick up books and uh, we can supply those because they've just been literally waiting around for um, to give them. And we finally feel like it's been long enough and we've got the public safety, public health pieces worked out. Um, so I apologize for not sharing that earlier in the update, but thank you, Mr. Harrington, for prompting me. So I, I have a, um, a question about all of the, so going back to your first part of the update of the, the roadmap for reopening, um, I found that document to be really easy to understand and easy to follow. So um, maybe in our, in our minutes, it would be nice to share that link um, so mm -hmm. that folks can see that because I'm sure not everybody took the detailed notes list of <laughs> not and items that you went through. But I, I did have the question about um, the the planning and, and there's, you know, some bit that's going, you know, as you mentioned and described, can happen now and we're going to get guidance in in um, late June and potentially additional guidance in August. Right. Um, how does the timing and the, and the amount of work and the and numbers of people that have to be involved, staff and, and educators, um, to, to develop those plans, how much of that can fit into our normal sort of work work schedule um, in terms of the calendar? Versus, um, is there additional time, additional effort? Is it how, you know how are we going? Yeah. To <laughs> so, uh, just one clarification: when you say hour, is that? Tell me what you mean by hour. I, like you know our schedule oh oh the um the uh, district uh the district calendar um, oh, okay okay if presumably if there's if there's a staff that need to be involved or educators that need to be involved that have a have a longer a summer break for example I see. yeah so yeah we will probably need to bring some folks in over the summer for that and pay them out of title 2a or other funding sources to be able to finish that. There are um, the facilitators of the groups almost exclusively are full year employees. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that it will involve more than just full year employees to, to be able to work on this. And, and again, the goal of having guiding documents is that it makes it a whole lot easier once we get um, guidance from Department of Public Health, CDC, the governor uh, to fit in within guiding documents. Um, if we wait to receive the guiding documents, the concern that I have and many uh, and other districts are doing similar work as well. I mean, there's never been more collaboration between superintendents than in the last two months. Um, that's for sure. Um, is that if we wait till the guidance comes out, um, what we've learned multiple times over the last couple months has been, uh, you'd have no time to actually implement. 
Um, so, you know, that, that's the thinking is creating what, what some got get documents for us. I mean, I, I pick on the chairs in a classroom, but it's a really acute issue at the elementary level because most of our kindergarten and first grade classrooms have tables. They don't have desks. That's a really open question right now, whether we would come back with tables versus desks. Another open question is uh, most of our elementary classrooms, particularly those at Fort River and Wildwood, which have less real estate, uh, usable real estate in the classrooms, um, have secondary work areas in the room. So it means the desks or the tables are closer together because you have a secondary work area. That's a really open question whether that's possible and has tons of instructional implications, right? So whatever the guidance is from, you know, uh, the folks and authorities that are going to give it, we can safely presume that it's not going to be business as usual in the fall and that there's going to be some social distancing and physical distancing guidelines. So we want to be thinking ahead of time about what are the educational implications as well as the facility management implications. We have a whole lot of desks at the barn right outside Fort River uh, that no one's, you know, looked for in a while. So we don't want to be getting a guidance in mid-August and scrambling. We want to actually have some guiding principles that, that help us think about long before we get the actual how many feet it is and whatever they'll say. So we'll be able to be agile in receiving that guidance and implementing. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer for, I could have just said staff may have to come in over the summer and we'll compensate them from Title IIA. That probably would have been an easier answer. Um, no, that was, I, the detail was, was, was super helpful to hear sort of how you're thinking about it and how you're approaching it. And I have one other quick question you mentioned, and then I see your hand, Ms. Spitzer. Um, you mentioned um, we have very few students or families that that are not, that we haven't heard from. And I was just wondering if you could give us sort of an estimate of sort of families, families where, or students that have disappeared, or, or you know, in terms of how many families are we engaging and reaching sort of with the so at the elementary level, you know, I just, I, it's such a small number, I want to be unidentifiable. Uh, I don't want it to be identifiable, but I could count the number of families on one hand that we haven't made contact with. And we do have next steps to family centers working on this in the email my inbox, which I've yet read because it came right before the meeting started from Dr. Guevara uh, on some next steps uh, for families um, in that boat. But at the elementary level, it's, it's um, low single digits. Okay. Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. I just wanted to kind of follow up on your question, Allison, which is that um, I I appreciated the roadmap, and I also looked at that document you said, and I was trying to track it down in your email, but the the process mapping um, document that you said um, website that you sent, and it had a whole piece there, kind of on on the school committee governance piece of yes. that. And I'm assuming that's different from the governance group that you were re referencing um, in your update right now. But I think it would be useful to kind of know how we can be supportive and also on which pieces of this, and I'm sure you, they're to be, be determined, but to the extent that you can, you kind of where we're going to be, and by we, I mean the school committee, yeah. the team, um, stepping in and supporting this work. I think if I could jump in, I think it's a huge piece uh, and I'm glad you raised it. Uh, one of the things that I say and every time this topic comes up, which is often is there's two things, there's public health and public confidence. And one without the other won't work. Um, and you know, I won't say they're equally important. Respectfully, I think the public health is more important than the public confidence. But we're not going to open school if, if those th those both of those aren't in place. And I think the public meetings and the nature of school committee is really where a lot of the public confidence on the the, the family side comes in. I think the staff side is is that that's more my job. Um, and so I do imagine that when we get to late June, early July, we probably will need to have more meetings than we would typically have in the summer. Uh, I apologize for that in advance, but I think it's gonna be really important for us to have conversations and perhaps even forums where families can voice their concern, uh, concerns. And you know, I think much like I talked about with distance learning, I think this is another one we're gonna see a sharp split in the families uh, in the community, like in every other community next fall. Uh, if, assuming schools do reopen in some way, shape or form, there's going to be families that want to come in and they want to have school um, as as they're going to feel safer uh, sending their children to school and perhaps question some of the safeguards that we put in place. There's going to be families who think the safeguards are exactly the right thing. And there's going to be families who don't send their children back. That's, you know, that I can predict safely. Everything else, what it's going to look like, uh, I don't have a good prediction on, but that I know. And so I think if you look nationally as well as locally, you'll see a large disparity on on 
how people view even just the physical and social distancing guidelines that have been in place that don't relate to schools. And um, so I think the best thing we can do is engage as many people as possible on what our plans are, how we'll adapt them, because um, there's going to be a number of what happens when, uh, what happens when we have a student, if we have a student who tests positive, what happens if we have a staff member who tests positive, does that mean school closed, does that mean classrooms closed, right, the number of variables and um, planning uh, aspects that are needed are going to be really high. Um, and I do think the school committee is a great vehicle. And I think that's part of the governance piece is to question, you know, all the things that we're doing contribute to the plans that were developed and, and also to be communicating and be a tool that staff, community members can access in addition to staff uh, if they do have concerns about one thing or another. So I, I do anticipate us having more meetings over the summer. I can imagine them being joint meetings, frankly, and I'm, I'm not going to get out of turn. And I'm able to say that stuff a little easier than you because I'm not open meeting law doesn't apply to me in the same way it applies to all of you, but uh, I do think there's going to have to be active conversations and forums over the summer because the public confidence piece isn't going to happen from an email. I just don't see it. Sorry, again, another long-winded response. I'll get better. <laughs> good. Any other questions or, or comments from the committee? Not seeing any. Um, great. Thank you very much. Long-winded, but um, but really helpful and important information. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next item is FY21 budget update and discussion. So I'll start, and then um, Dr. Slaughter's here. So if there's questions I can't answer, which I'm sure there will be, he'll be there to offer that. So, excuse me. I think there'd be kind of three big buckets, or not big, three buckets of information I'd like to share. The first bucket is just what a level funded budget means for the Amherst Public Schools. And so I know we talked about it before. I've done some thinking. Dr. Slaughter's done some thinking. I have communicated my thoughts to the town, uh, to excuse me, the town manager. So most departments in the town uh, received financial um, finance committee recommendation for a 2.5% increase for the next for fiscal year 21. We all know that's not going to happen anymore. If you may remember that our memo said 2.8% increase, uh, not 2.5. And the reason was is that we had a reduction in the number of the charter costs. And because those get paid through the town and then come to the schools, there's been many years where we've had a 1.9% increase instead of 2.5 or 2.1%. But since we had positive numbers as it relates to charter school enrollment, um, that 0.3 was unrelated to the increase the town offered us uh, supported the operating budget. It's just because of the reimbursement for charter school costs. So uh, my position, uh, which doesn't have to be your position at all, but my position is that uh, a level funded budget for the Amherst public schools would be, um, would take away the two and a half percent and not the 0.3 percent because that's unrelated to the increase uh, that we got from the town. That's truly just a reimbursement for costs. Um, uh, related to charter school. Um, and in this case, it worked in our benefit. There's been most years uh, in the last five years or six years, oh, actually, since they started this. So um, Sandy Pooler was still working here. So I don't know what year that was, whether it was the sort of passing of the torch with Catherine Oppie at a town meeting. I don't remember what year that was. Uh, but when they when they organized themselves where it went through the town, um, you know, I, I don't think, I'm trying to be sensitive to the town's fiscal needs, but this seems unrelated to the fiscal needs. This is just about reimbursement for charter school costs. Um, so uh, the difference would be at a um, at a level funded budget that was a minus 2.8%, essentially, it's about 670, 660, $670,000 cut. Uh, at a 2.5% decrease, it's about um, 596 or seven. Um, as Dr. Slaughter worked out the numbers before. I think it was off by a thousand. It's one of those two. Um, percent cut six it looks like he's holding up um 596 and, and i know that's not a huge difference but actually uh, it is significant when you're cutting that much from a budget to seventy thousand dollars essentially um that's a staff member um and so i guess uh i would like to share with this board that um my perspective is that you know i'd like us to advocate around that that um, not to be insensitive to other town departments, but the other town departments don't have this additional variable about reimbursement for charter school costs that um, seems unrelated to the current budget situation. So that's 
sort of the first amount of, of uh, the first thing I'd like to share. Um, maybe I'll stop and take questions after each instead of going through um, a longer spiel. I don't know if there's questions or comments on what I'm sharing. Mr. Deming? I mean, just briefly, is it too early to say whether it's your sense from town's financial leaders, whether that 2.5% versus the 2.8% is the more reasonable number for the schools to be proposing? I would suggest that uh, the town manager heard my perspective and understood my perspective. I don't think it's been talked about at a town council. I didn't watch just last night's meeting. I doubt it would have been talked about. Um, um, I, I, I wouldn't, I want to be really clear. I don't think he agreed to it or if that was it, but I don't think it was something that he took lightly or didn't understand my perspective on. Any other questions? No? Okay. All right. The second piece that I'd like to talk about is just the great uncertainty of um, state funding right now uh, and federal funding, but I'll, I think we talked about that at a previous meeting. Uh, Dr. Slaughter and I were on a conference call. Um, I was not, actually, Dr. Slaughter wasn't on this conference at all. I was on a conference call yesterday with the commissioner and other um, DESE staff. Uh, it's been clear that they don't have a great sense of where the state's gonna come down. And I think my perception, I don't have this confirmed, is that the state's waiting to see what the federal government does before they release any numbers. Because once they release the numbers, that's the, the numbers people think about. And at least what's being discussed at the federal level is it would have a significant impact on the state budget. Um, so right now, we don't have a great sense of even Chapter 70 or any of those pieces. Um, the guidance I continue to receive is a level funded budget from the town. That could change. There's a meeting on Monday night, as you know, uh, where there's going to be some guidance given. But that's the way we're proceeding is with that um, level funded guidance. And at this point, the way I'm proceeding, um, and I will advocate for this in public if need be, is that level funding for us is the 2.5 reduction that all the other town departments are looking at, um, not including the 0.3%. Um, but you know, as I get any information from the state, I'll certainly let you know. But um, I did talk to Mr. Bachman as well, and uh, he's not hearing anything from his professional organization, MMA, either. I think everybody's sort of waiting on things. And I think the challenge that those of you who watched um, the budget coordinating group meeting over there heard me say is that we can't wait forever because we have to know how many sections of classes we're in. We're gonna have to place students. We have to figure out um, special needs students and their IEPs and ELL students and their plans. Uh, we're not an organization that, uh, you know, use the word before agile. Schools are like big, districts are like big boats. When you turn them, it takes a while to get everybody going in that, right? And we don't have the flexibility um, to be able to do that. Um, we also have a contract state law that uh, we have to let staff know by just June 15th uh, about reduction in force notices. Um, and our association has been very flexible in working with us, uh, but that's that's not something that can be uh, negotiated out. It's, it's it's state law that we have to do that. Um, so we sort of, that's actually a great segue to the third thing, which is that we are actively involved in planning uh, with staff, we did uh, we had a, a staff town hall last week. Uh, we did a staff survey on budget thoughts. If anyone wanted to share them, um, we had some good ones that we've started to implement, including early retirement incentives uh, offers for for staff members because that could help our budget. Uh, we're, we are looking about using a significant amount of our school choice reserve fund, and uh, you know we've frozen the budget for essentially frozen the budget. We call it a frost, uh, essential purchases only. And um, that will help us in terms of next year's budget because there are some things that we can prepay with uh, funds out of this year's budget. So we're doing everything we can do to maintain things because one of the things that is really hard and a lot of educational researchers are starting to say this is we all know we're gonna have costs that we don't, we don't know right now what they're gonna be next year. And so it, it's, I understand the, the financial situation deeply and if people want us to run schools with the constraints they're gonna put on them, uh, there's going to be financial price tags to it that we don't know. Uh, one piece of good news is that the CARES Act, the Federal CARES Act, will have uh, funds come coming to us in the next, um, probably for the next fiscal year. We'll have a year and a half or two years to be able to use it. And it's based on Title I allocation. We get a fair amount of money from Title I. Title I is a federal program that um, looks at poverty and, associate, and district size and then uh, provides funding based on those two factors. So large urban districts get a lot. 
uh, wealthy suburban districts get very little, and we're in the middle of those, uh, both demographically and then financially as well. Um, so we will have some funding coming our way, most likely. The state put in their application last Friday. They're supposed to hear back from the federal government relatively soon. Uh, all that being said, um, you know, there's just some things that don't make any sense in this environment as it relates to budget. It doesn't make sense to increase class size because, you know, for sort of obvious physical distancing reasons, you know, there are some classes, frankly, that we, we started to look at. Uh, could we could we deal with one less section? Uh, and we probably could under a normal situation. In this situation, I don't know how that, it seems like that would be wildly inconsistent with the guidance we're going to receive. Um, and there are a lot of other things that in a normal circumstance, you say, well, you know, if we had to cut, we could maybe do without. But, you know, we're being very cautious about that because we don't want to make uh, financially driven decisions that actually are inconsistent with the public health that guidance we're getting. And and that's going to be our conundrum from a financial point of view. We're entering a school year where there's never been a school year that has more unknowns than next school year. And so we're trying to preserve as best we can, uh, as many staff as we can, knowing that we're going to have to be really flexible um, with them. So those, that's the third bucket is just, you know, how we're approaching this budget task. So we're, we're in a lot of budget meetings. We'll come back two weeks from tonight with a budget hearing. Uh, we'll release that to staff the Friday before and the public, what the proposed cuts are so that people have an opportunity to weigh in uh, before that budget hearing. Uh, we'll also probably do a live session kind of like this for staff if they want to hear about it, because we always, you know, our rules, we always want to make sure staff know before the larger, uh, you know, community would have access to that information. And that'd be our plan in this regard as well. So that's, uh, Dr. Slaughter, what did I miss? <clears throat> I'm not sure you missed anything. Um, you, know, you sort of captured the, the conundrum we're in in a lot of ways that, uh, you know, there's some things that are going to be uh, in additional costs or additional costs that we'll have next year that we, you know, can anticipate by virtue of the constraints we'll operate under, but the funding picture is so unclear. Um, you know, I was reading something a little bit earlier today regarding just our legislator getting, legislature getting together to even have meetings. They do roll call votes on budget. They can't do that yet. So everything's been informal conversations to point to this point. So they're really struggling just how to do the mechanics of a budget at the state level, much less under, you know, trying to capture the, the idea of how much uh, revenue they might or might not have. Um, Ms. Spitzer. I'm just curious, and because you brought up the CARES Act, and I know that part of the CARES Act is also that staff members who might have, um, obligations to their own families are able, entitled to paid leave. Um, have we found that many families or potentially will, when will, sorry, but have we found that there are staff who have, we've had to put on um, leave due to their responsibilities? And if so, does that negatively impact our budget as well? All of the potential liabilities we'll have through the unemployment or is that covered by the federal um, money? So I'm going to speak in a theoretical because that's health related. So I can't really comment. Um, I know you're not asking, but I just have to be uber cautious. Uh, also, be though, it's not just health. It's like I have, you know, if you have children, childcare responsibilities. There are right. whole reasons you could be invoking the the need to take a a, a leave as a result. And I'm just wondering right. if those. I, I'm just anticipating in the same way that we're going to potentially have kids who opt not to come back in the fall that I could see that. Um, there would be staff members who choose not to come in back in the fall for multiple personal reasons as well. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Slaughter, do you have any comments about the fall piece? I mean, I think, you know, the short story is we haven't seen a lot of that in the spring, but because we're not asking staff members for the most part, I mean, the vast majority of staff don't come into the buildings. It, it mitigates some of that. It doesn't always feel like that, <laughs> I'm sure, for a lot of working families, but the reality is it's not like you're, you're leaving your children at home unattended. Um, it's just a very challenge to do your work at home, which is a different scenario. But um, I don't know if Dr. Schlotter's thoughts on the potential liability in fall. Yeah, I think that what I would suggest is that, I mean, it, a lot of it will depend upon how, and, you know, of course, this, this plays out. In other words, so what are the things we're asking of staff to do? In other words, how do we shape and function within school? Uh, we'll make a big, you know, uh, decision tree for different people in, in different ways. Um, 
So, and you know, the impact though is if you know if someone can't return, what are tight timelines to hire? Um, you know, the, the, there's already been a, a sense that in the educational field there's a shortage of teachers anyway. So I think you know we and many many other districts might be in a real crunch. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of creative thinking we're going to have to do around our staff and see if we can find ways to to fit them into a structure. You know, given that we're doing school differently, how do we fit them in in a way that that works with their circumstances and that's an additional complication to just the mechanics of actually trying to teach well and and provide you know the kids a safe environment etc cetera, etc cetera. i i have a question um i i know we're not at the point that we're talking about i mean there's so much uncertainty so i i acknowledge and recognize that there's only there's only so much that we can um, talk about in terms of, of specifics at this point. Um, so my question isn't about specifics, but are there areas or, or sort of guiding principles um, that you're working with or working within um, as, as you look at sort of where are the possible areas where we can go to find that ideally $596,000 um, areas that we don't want to touch um, or keep intact and keep going versus areas that you know, literally like what are the guiding principles for how you're going about it? Sure. So, you know, I think as opposed to a typical budget year um, that the public health uh, considerations are really significant. So class size, I mentioned as example, um, I think some of the other ones is, is not losing flexibility uh, for, ways that students can be working in small groups um and you know i'm just being a uh, perhaps unusually cautious with my words but i think you know i'm just aware that people could read into some of the comments i'm saying and try to forecast uh what potential reductions would be in that that process is done but but i think the large framing is how do we not make cuts um make as few cuts as possible that are related to staffing and buildings for next year um, because of the public health pieces and how cuts that um, preserve don't make don't put on the list or the guiding principle of uh, if we need to be more flexible with staffing to decrease class sizes at certain parts of the day how do we maintain that flexibility um, it, it's driving a lot of our decision making which I don't think it's like it's just an additional consideration that we didn't usually have to think about. Um, so it is the public health pieces and the uncertainty are really pushing our thinking about what school will look like. And it's helping, pushing us to imagine multiple scenarios of what school will look like and not lose the flexibility that certain staff members have to provide that flexibility. And I'm sorry I'm speaking a little bit, but because I have been in a number of budget conversations, uh, it's a totally legitimate question, but I'm uh, I have the curse of having all those things in my head right now and trying to make sure I'm not uh, yeah. forecasting anything that um, that perhaps people would read too much into. So um, I think always we're talking about, you know, the students and, and their needs as well. I don't want to minimize that. Um, I think the other guiding principle I should mention is that um, in this district, um, I'm, unless I'm convinced otherwise, and so far no one's tried and no one's convinced me in our budget meetings, I'm not interested in cutting social emotional supports for kids. You know, and, and that's a complicated question because every staff member provides social emotional supports for kids and I want to be recognized that, but we do have staff members in terms of guidance, adjustment counselors, you know, staff school psychologists who um, have a particular area of expertise in that regard. And again, I'm not trying to protest them over anybody else. And that's why I get really wary of even going down this road. But I think there is some reality that their skill set to be working with kids, many of whom have experienced different levels of, of um, strain over this time period is going to be incredibly critical. And so while they may or may not be able to provide the physical distancing kind of pieces that we talked about, uh, I just, I, I don't know how you go down that road of suggesting that there's not uh, need, there's not going to be social emotional needs that, for students uh, more than we've ever seen before. Uh, and the professional staff who are kind of the primary leaders and the experts in that area, you know, I, I just don't know how you can go down a road of reducing the supports um, for social emotional needs for students. So I, I'm sorry, that was a little um, tangential, but you know, I guess I struggle because if I go further, I feel like I'm I'm going further than I should. And I, I see your your uh, question, uh, Mr. Demling, but a quick follow up on that because I know that I've, I've, I've 
been hearing um, from folks in the community, and I and I think it probably may have started with the with the Gazette article. Oh about yes, yeah. The budget planning, and so can you talk a little bit about Caminantes and um, and how how you're thinking on that? Yeah, so that happened, I think, because there was two budget two items on the agenda unrelated last time. There was the Caminantes about the, the lottery, and then there was a, it was an agenda item on budget. And the way the article read uh, unintentionally uh, juxtaposed those two. Um, so I did get a number of emails, as did the principal, you know, um, and the coordinator. Um, so we are not at this point looking at um, Caminantes to be um, a casualty of this budget situation. Just plainly, um, it, I think it just because they were both on the agenda last time. I could understand why people would would think they were linked, but um, they were not. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Demling? Yeah, um, just a couple comments and a question. Um, as to the 2.5% versus the, the extra 0.3 of the 2.8, um, I actually don't think that needs to be all that controversial once once people understand what it is. I mean, it's, it's essentially, the way I look at it, a, a, a bookkeeping issue, you know, of, of how the money gets moved around. and. I think the challenge there um, when communicating to the public and town officials is um, is just the wonkiness of that issue. So I think I think if you find a good way to clarify and clearly state to somebody who does not think about uh, all the funkiness of charter school funding and how that money gets shifted around, um, right. I think I think that should be, you know, I'm I'm pretty confident that um, that everyone will, will be on the same page. Um, you know, my other comment is, you know, when I'm, I'm looking at almost $600,000 in cuts, it just makes me, um, you know, it, it makes me think of recent history. And I mean, we, we cut things two years ago. And so th this idea that, uh, and I don't think anybody here is saying this, but I, I just think it's important to articulate out in front is, is that there's no way to cut that much and not violate our guiding principles. Yeah, you know, th there's a reason why everything that's in the budget and that is currently funded is there. It's because we value it, you know, and we would be doing more if we had if we had more resources. So, um, you know, when those cuts come out, and I'm sure you'll be as creative and efficient as possible, there is no getting around losing things in a painful way, and that that's just going to be the, the the nature of the beast. Um, you know, I, I I rarely rarely look this far back, but uh, it's it's hard not to think um about the the last building project and the estimated 500,000 in operational savings that we would have been realizing next year and how how that would have played uh into this situation um and you know I mean I only bring it up because I think when we have a rare opportunity to secure the financial well-being of our schools in town I think uh when we have that opportunity again I, th I think we need to take it um and so the the other question I had you know we keep talking about level funded budget from what i've seen in the paper at least the the town manager is talking about level funded as a best case scenario right. so what, to what degree that you're able to share now do, do you have confidence that we are actually looking at only a level funded budget of 600,000 ish in cuts and not and not significantly worse i can only go what i'm told so um that's that's what we're planning for, you know, obviously when you make decisions, when you even come up with a proposed budget, you come up with many different scenarios that go well beyond the actual number because through discussion with principals and other district directors, you end up with uh, a longer list that you then make some decisions from. Um, so at this point, that's still the guidance I continue to receive. We'll get formal guidance on Monday uh, from the town manager and town council and finance committee. If it's something radically different, we're going to have to alter our timeline. Uh, but uh, you know, I keep coming back to the two key points. One is, um, and, and again, I said this at the, at the regional meeting as well, and it's a hard, or maybe the joint meeting. Uh, we are in a competitive industry, and if we start reducing things that make us less viable to many families or less attractive to many families, our costs functionally increase. Right, our our deficit actually increases because. Families have other options. That's the way education works in 2020. And so I really worry if we have to go uh, too deep on cuts and I get the financial realities, but if it happens, it happens. It actually starts, uh, my concern is it would start uh, to have a catalytic effect that would actually be 
uh, increasingly negative for the schools beyond the actual cuts that would need to be made, because I think it would only be get more cuts in the future. I think the second piece is that uh, for the community to reopen, uh, schools need to be open, right? Um, I think you talk to any working parent with kids at home right now, uh, and uh, how challenging that situation, especially young kids, how challenging that situation is. And we are seen as, I think rightfully so, as a critical piece to opening you know, the economy, which is obviously critical for the budget in other ways. Now we have to do that safely where I don't wanna be, I don't perceive that anyone's looking at us as a pawn of a larger economic interest, at least in Amherst. I can't speak to other areas or what people in other governments uh, would say. Um, so I think it's really critical that we have the resources we need to to open in the way, because uh, I think once we start getting to the place where we don't have that flexibility, we need going into the school year, it's going to force some bad decisions to be made, right, about, you know, whether we're able to open, how do we, how can we reopen? So, you know, um, again, you know, I've been around this block a couple of times with budget cuts. I try to be very realistic and work with our towns. But I think there has to be a shared commitment that uh, if we feel, if the community feels like the schools need to open, uh, we're going to make, you know, roughly $600,000 cuts. We start going beyond that. We're going to lose some flexibility. And when we do get guidance from the state and federal government and CDC and Department of Public Health, we need to be able to implement them with fidelity. Um, and it gets back to that public confidence piece as well as the public health piece. And so, again, I'm not trying to uh, say that we're any more important than any other town agency. I don't want anyone to perceive that. All I know is as an advocate for schools and, and knowing what I know and hearing what I hear from public health folks, we're gonna re need to retain the vast majority of our staff to be able to provide um, that kind of support and open in the way that I think is in every student and staff member's best interest. So I'll get off my soapbox, but um, that's, my, that's what I'd share at this point um, in terms of advocacy to, to maintain at that level. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Any other questions from the committee? Not seeing any. And um, before we move off of the um, budget topic, I, I do wanna circle back to our, our timeline um, for, for budget development and approval. Um, so we do have, um, as Dr. Morris has referenced a few times, um, we have our joint meeting on Monday with the town council and the library trustees in the budget coordinating group um, where we'll hear um, financial indicators um, from the town, which is guidance on, on where, um, where the town budget will be heading. Um, so that's on Monday, May 11th. On Tuesday, May 19th, um, this committee is meeting again for a, where we'll hear the detailed budget um, schools budget for Amherst schools, and that will also be um, a, a hearing, a budget hearing. Um, so another opportunity for the community to provide comment on budget planning for the Amherst schools. Um, and then um, our final budget is due to the town on June 1st. Um, and right now we have, during um, the week of the 26th, um, our budget vote. And I and I think we, we just didn't get to clarity or, or um, final on whether that's going to be um, on the same day as the as another committee meeting um, and budget vote, which is that Tuesday the 26th, or if we want to have that on a separate day, um, Thursday the 28th. Um, I don't think we need to decide that today unless folks um, have strong feelings about deciding that. Yeah. I'm not seeing anybody sort of passionately objecting to either one. <laughs> so, um, any other comments on the timeline for the budget? Dr. Morris. Just one more thing to, to add to my response to Mr. Demling's question is that um, it's really unclear when the state's gonna have their budget set. So I do wanna be realistic and I'm talking to staff a lot about this is that we're following the guidance we received from the town in terms of their timeline. Um, all bets are off on when we're gonna get real guidance from the state of how much is even gonna come through in chapter 70. So. We're going to follow, and you know, even when we talk to staff about the six hundred thousand dollar cuts, this is where we are right now. There, there's lots of uncertainty; it's very foggy ahead on the road, um, and we may be back at this at you know within that month because the state guidance is really different than what the town was expecting. But you know, our goal is to have a um, reasonable budget, um, you know, that tries to again maximize 
um, what our students need as well as what the public health needs are um, submitted to the town by June 1st. But I, I think it's an important point that Mr. Deming raised, you know, before about the uncertainty ahead. Any follow up comments or questions? Final. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on to our next um, item, which is um, warrant reporting. Um, and I have many <laughs> as, as the, the signer of warrants. So I'm going to pull my um, other device up here so that I can read um, from here. So I have, um, just to prepare folks, I have five that I'm going to be reading from. Um, so um, I um, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $62,538.60 for a warrant dated March 30th, 2020 that included general fund expenses of $2,189.33, revolving fund expenses of $21,955, sorry, $21,955.97, and grant fund expenses of $4,357.06, and other funds, $33,836.24. Signed and dated by me April 15th, 2020. Um, I also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $63,571.14 for a warrant dated April 13th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $50,829.81, sorry, $50,829.81, revolving fund expenses of $12,177.37, and grant fund expenses of $563.96, and other funds zero, signed, in, signed by me on April 15th. I also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $62,000. Is this? Nope, this is a different. $62,538.60 for a warrant dated also March 30th, 2020, including general fund expenses of $2,189.33, revolving fund expenses of $22,155.97, and granted fund expenses of $4,357.06 and, and other funds of $33,836.24 signed by me on April 10th. And I also authorized by my signature to payables an amount of $91,935.97 for a warrant dated April 27th. For, this includes general fund expenses of $91,935.97, as well as revolving fund expenses of $892.83 and other funds of $758.78, signed by me on May 4th, 2020. And finally, um, I authorized by my signature on for on April 29th, um, payroll total wages subject um, uh, to Benicare in a total of six hundred and seventy thousand six hundred and fifty one dollars and sixteen cents. So we're, um, we haven't had warrants on our agenda for a while, and because I don't want to read for five minutes like that, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to um, do a better job of getting these on the agenda on a more frequent, regular basis. Any comments or questions on that? Okay. Moving on, um, we have some gifts to accept this evening, and they were included in our packet on page five. Mr. Harrington, would you like to make a motion? Well, I actually had a question. Um, 
is it possible to separate the gifts from the grant as far as voting or do we or does it make more sense to vote on all of those together i'll look to dr slaughter for yep yeah. dr slaughter gonna be able to work my mouth um so the grants you don't technically have to uh accept uh it's more informational so that is just for information purposes actually accepting is the gift so you can just do one motion for the gifts and that should handle it thank you okay mr harrington would you like to continue to the motion <laughs> sure i i move to accept the following gifts uh AR, arps pgo number two one thank you two one two one five eight distance to support distance learning and internet access gift a total of twenty three thousand dollars from linda prothers to support safety latches for crocker farm preschool uh playground gates estimated at two hundred dollars from Martha Olver, number 995740, Crocker Farm at Principal Discretion, $10. From Jen Jennifer Vanderleen, Leiden and Family, Books for K2 Intervention Students of Wildwood Elementary School, estimated at $600 for a total of $23,010. Moved by Mr. Harrington. I'll second. second. Oh, Mr. Demling. Seconded by Demling. Dr. Morris. I just want to um, share that Linda Prothers is a longtime preschool teacher in the district. She is retiring this spring and just lovely that she would make this gift, but she has worked with uh, many, many three, four and five year olds uh, across many schools because the preschool wasn't always at Crocker Farm. Um, and she, she's traveled to different schools um, and ending a really wonderful career. So we appreciate the gift, but I also want to take the moment to also appreciate her work uh, and her career in the district. Mr. Demling. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's always wonderful to get gifts. And I was just um, remarking what, what, a, what an interesting eclectic group of gift types this is. You know, we have this uh, amazing grant from AEF, and they're always coming in with grants. We have the um, the, the uh, fantastic uh, distance learning fundraising for the hotspots that the PGOs uh, did that we've, we've spoken about before. Um, what Dr. Morris just spoke, spoke of, and we have we have a, t a ten dollar gift, and you know these these gifts can be incredibly meaningful regardless of of the amount. You know, it's it's really it's 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 about the individual and and when it's coming from the heart as it so often does in gifts to the schools it's just it's just really impressive we got a really nice um letter um that was shared from the um the vander leiden family about the about the books um and it's just so great you know in in a time of obvious uh financial uh constraint um as we just spoke of to, to see this kind of outpouring from so many different aspects of our community is really heartwarming Any other uh, comments or discussion on our gifts? Okay. Otherwise, we'll move to um, a roll call vote, um, beginning with uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. McDonald, aye. It carries uh, five to zero. Everyone. Um, does anybody want to make a final motion or next? Mr. Harrington. I move to adjourn. Second. Moved by Harrington, by Demling. There's no discussion. So uh, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling. 
Gamling I. And McDonald I. We are adjourned. Thank you all, and thank you, Amherst Media. <laughs>